Hi everyone, and welcome back to the SIP here at Cal Academy. My name is Amy Jo and I'll be your host today. Today we're joined by Natalie, one of our individual scientists at the Summer Systematics Institute. So Natalie, would you mind introducing yourself with your name, your pronouns, as well as your school and your major? Of course. Hi, I'm Natalie Beckman Smith, she, her, and I'm currently a biology student at the University of Cal State Northridge, sorry, California University Northridge. Great, awesome. And what do you study at Cal State? Biology, specifically ecology and evolutionary biology. Great, thanks. So let's hop right into our first question. <laughs> I know you've been spending quite a lot of time out in the field this summer. Um, would you feel comfortable sharing a little bit about your daily schedule and what it was like in the field? Yes, absolutely. So me and another intern, Haley Schmidt, we spent two weeks camping at the Caples Creek Watershed, which is located in the Sierra Nevadas. Mm -hmm. And I think I have some pictures that I'll show. Great. Of the study site. It's a beautiful study site in the Sierra Nevadas. Mm -hmm. And so our job specifically was to survey plants at points that had not been surveyed after they've been burned. And so a typical day is we would wake up super early, sometimes before the sun even came up while it was still dark, and we would hike out to the cluster of points that we were going to survey that day. And we would use GPS and maps to navigate to the points. And we would try to use trails as much as we could, but to get to the exact locations, we had to do a lot of bushwhacking, which involved like climbing over down trees and scrabbling up and down granite slopes and crossing rivers using logs and all sorts of crazy stuff. So that was super fun. And once we got to the points, we would do a detailed written site description and we would also photo catalog every species of plant within an 11.3 meter radius at the point. And if we saw anything super cool, we would actually collect the live plant and bring it back to camp where we would press it using a plant press. And so then after we finished our cluster of points, we would head back to camp, hopefully before it got too hot and we ran out of water. So that was a day's work. Great, great. That sounds like a beautiful trip that you had. And yeah. um, would you mind explaining what a plant press is? Sure, so a plant press is used to collect plant vouchers or plant specimens. And so what you do is you take the live plant and you essentially put it in between two pieces of newspaper and then two pieces of corrugated cardboard. And you, you stack them all up on top of each other, all these plant newspaper cardboard, like a sandwich. And then you enclose it with these straps and you pull the straps as tight as you can and step on it and sit on it to get it as smushed as you can. And then you leave that out to dry. So it flattens and dries the plants and retains their, their shape and hopefully their color as well. Wow, that's very interesting. So I heard between all of the plant pressing and the observing and um, surveying of sites that you had an encounter with a bear. Yes. <laughs> In your trip to the Sierras, would you mind sharing with us about that encounter? Of course, I'd love to. So Haley and I had just been dropped off at the top of Hay Flat Trail, it was just the two of us. And we hiked down and did our very first plant point that morning, we finished up and we were just talking, figuring out, you know, okay, what direction do we go to get to our next point? And I'm looking at the GPS, I'm like, okay, we have to go right over there. And I point and right where I was pointing out of the woods, comes lumbering this big black bear and it was less than 50 meters away and it was coming in our direction. It had no idea we were there, it didn't notice us. So Haley and I looked at each other like, oh gosh, what do we do? So we did what we were told to do. You know, we put our, our hands up to our mouths and we screamed, hey bear, hey bear, as loud as we could. And the bear, it looked up at us and it turned and ran back into the woods, which is exactly what, you know, a bear is supposed to do, which is good. The problem was it ran the exact direction that we had to go to get to our next point. So we kind of looked at each other like, what should we do? I guess we'll just, we gave it a couple minutes to get ahead of us. And then we, we took the safety off of our bear spray and we had our bear bell, which is like a little jingle bell that you, you ring to scare away bells. And 
we were like ringing it for our lives as we walked into <laughs> the woods and we got to our next point and it was kind of in the woods in between these two big slabs of granite and there is fresh bear poop everywhere and I, I think I have a picture of one of the bear bear poops I can show you there it is at the top um, left so Whoa. there was that just everywhere around the point we're like oh gosh so we we did the survey as fast as we could and got out of there and when we went back to camp and told it everyone our advisor Jarrell he was like oh yeah th that's a bear den down there we probably should have told you guys <laughs> so. close encounters with bears mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> it was a cute bear, a very cute bear. Oh my goodness. Well, I guess you did all you could and mm -hmm. ringing the bell scared yes. right away. <laughs> exactly. Good to know. Um, so I had a question as a wannabe bird nerd. Um, do you have any tips for bird watching or for bird spotting yes. specifically? They're so fast. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So the three, I have three tips to give you. One of them is because you're hearing the birds but not seeing them, correct? Mm -hmm. So the first one I'd say is just like stay, stay where you are, just stand still. And mm -hmm. if you kind of, sometimes if you just pretend you're not paying attention to them, the birds will actually kind of reveal themselves to you. They might come to you. So just staying where you are for a little bit can make them come out. And the second tip I have is to look for movement. Like you said, they're very fast, but it's good, it gives away their location sometimes. So sometimes I'll hear a bird and I'll be looking right at it, but I don't see it until it actually moves. And then my third tip is to look in likely areas. And this becomes easier, you know, the more you do it, but you'll start to, to realize, oh, this bird, the species it likes to go on the ground, or this bird prefers pine trees. So the one location, for beginning birders that I point out is a lot of birds like to sing in perches at, at the top or near the top of trees or sometimes in a branch that sticks out away from a tree. So sometimes scanning those areas can reveal a bird. Nice. So that might tie into my next question, which is, which is your favorite bird, if any? Oh, and where, where would you find them in in the tree, in the canopy, on the ground? It's hard to choose a favorite, but I think I'll have to say I really love Capra forms, and they, they're a really cool group of birds. The common names are like night hawks or poor wills or night jars, and they're these really weird kind of camouflage looking nocturnal birds. They're actually very closely related to hummingbirds. They kind of seem like polar opposites, but you'll see them at night flying through the air. Sometimes the best time to see them is right at twilight because you can still see them, it's light enough and they'll be kind of soaring around catching insects. So those are those are super cool birds. Wow, awesome. And are you able to see those here in California or? Yes, absolutely. I actually saw them for the first time in person when I was doing my uh, summer internship work in the Sierras. Wow, that's so mm -hmm. cool. What, what do they look like if you can give us like a description of like their color and how would you so identify it? They have coloring sort of similar to an owl where it's almost mimics like tree bark in a way, but their shape is more close to, I'd say like a swift. They're, they're kind of large, you know, they, they kind of have like a, a large predatory bird shape almost and they have very long wings, big wingspan but they're very aerodynamic because they're flying, you know, to catch insects. So they kind of have that plane shape almost. Nice, lovely. Um, thank you for sharing. Do you have a moment in which you realized your love for nature, perhaps? I have loved nature since I can remember, but one moment does stick out to me. It was when I was really little and I was playing on my um, grandparents' avocado, uh, acre and I actually saw a um I came upon a red-shouldered hawk that had just landed on the ground and it didn't notice me so I was able to get within just a couple feet of it before it took off in this flurry of feathers and it was just so I was awestruck that's always stuck with me oh lovely thanks for sharing on an avocado grove yeah <laughs> grove? Mm -hmm. wow how lovely. Where was where was that tree out of curiosity? Or that, um, that grove? La Harbor Heights. 
California, home of the Haas avocado. <laughs> nice. Cool. And I wanted to ask you on your slideshow, the top right, um, mm -hmm. what is that device on the top right? So in the top right, that's an ARU or an automatic recording unit. And mm -hmm. those were being used at the different points throughout the study site to um, record bird calls. And so mm -hmm. every, I think it was every 30 minutes, it would go on and it would record bird calls for a specific amount of time. And so we could then see, you know, what birds were living in the area and at what points. Wow. So they're, they're taking audio recording? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And is it a constant stream of, of information being recorded or how do they work? It's on a timer. So I, I believe it goes on every 30 minutes. So I think it's like twice an hour and it records for maybe five minutes. I could be wrong about that, but then it goes for, for 24 hours. So we have at the study site, real people doing point counts, but that's only in the morning. So what's cool about the ARU is that they, they do recordings around the clock. So you get stuff like owls and like the night hawks, like I was talking about and other species. Cool. And then directly below it, what, what's on your hands? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's how our hands and pretty much our whole bodies looked every day after we finished. It's just dirt and it's a lot of um, soot and ash from the burned areas. It's just covered mm. in it. Wow. Does, um, so does that soot and ash reflect in like the air quality still, or is it just mostly settled? It is settled, but when you walk through it, it, it kicks up. And at some mm. points, yeah, we were like coughing and <laughs> it becomes a little hard to breathe in the really burned areas. Wow. Cool. Awesome. Um, did you have another slide that you... So you I wanted had, to show with some more photos? I had some from my work before. Sure. I just put in some, some stuff that I do at my school. I do like specimen taxidermy. These are study skins that I've done of different birds. And sure. I had another slide of some other bird related work that I've done, like bird banding and surveying and then some nest monitoring. And managing. Wow. So how do you band birds? How does that work? How do you capture them and, and get the band on their on their leg, right? Yeah, so usually. We set up um, what's called a mist net and it's like a very, very fine net that the mm -hmm. bird, when it's stretched taut, the birds can't see it. So they fly right into it. And then we go and we remove them. We un untangle them from the net and then we do what's called processing them where we record their weight and you know we measure how long their wings are and their tails and we write it all down we sex them and age them and then we put um, a band on them which has a band number that we record and it goes into this big database on bandit and so if the bird is ever recaptured the person who captures it will record that it where it was captured and we can kind of track uh, bird movement and migration that way wow that's really interesting that's so cool. So in the in the photo where you've got like a binder beside you, mm -hmm. um, what are you doing in that photo? So the binder is, is the pile guide and it's mm -hmm. kind of called the, the Bible to bird banders because it has all the information we need in order to age and sex all the different species we might capture. And in my hand, I'm holding a lesser goldfinch and you can see the close up of it in the middle there. So I'm I'm looking at it and I think I was measuring its um, wing feathers in that picture. And I have on um, the magnifying glasses so I can see up close. Wow, well, thanks for sharing those. And the, the other slide you said you had, um, you were doing taxidermy. Yes. Um, would you share a little bit about that? Absolutely. So I. I've always loved seeing the um, like taxidermy in museums as a kid, and I've always wanted to be able to do it myself. And I just love natural history museums and their collections. So when I got that opportunity through my school, I was so excited. And it's just such a cool thing to be able to preserve these you know, beautiful species and have them be used for, for science in the future. And 
I really enjoy it. I know a lot of people don't, they're, they're a little like queasy about it, but I don't mind. And I think it's, it's really fun. So we'll get, my school actually gets a lot of its uh, exotic birds from the Playboy Mansion because <laughs> we have an alumni who works at their aviary. And so I think, I think the three birds that you see together in the picture were all from there. And so we will receive donations from places like that or from zoos or from rescues. I donate um, birds that through uh, my bird banding organization, sometimes, you know, unfortunately they do die during the process. And so I will donate mm -hmm. those to my school and then they can be, you know, used for, for science and teaching. Okay, great. Um, so after these were prepared, mm -hmm. um, where do, where do they go from there? Do you do you know where these went? Perhaps. Yeah. So these all go into my school's collection room, and they're used like as teaching aids. We bring them out for like the vertebrate zoology class and other classes for students to be able to you know actually see these species in person and hold them and. And look at them and we also use them for research so we have at my school it's um, a, physi a bird physiology lab I believe that studies or morphology so they, they can actually kind of almost look back in time and see these specimens that were collected from decades ago and kind of compare them to more recent specimens and they can do their research that way. Wow I can see how that could be very useful and um, what what is this? What is the specimen at the bottom left? <laughs> <laughs> so that's me. Um, in addition to uh, donating birds, I also like to donate other animals. So here I was collecting insects off of a dead possum that I found. I, I should have donated the possum as well, but I have donated insects, birds, and plants to my school's collections. And I, I love it. I love collecting and I love curating. Wow. Well, I think that's a great stopping place for us today. And thank you so much for sharing your love for collecting and uh, field research. So thank you so much, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. See you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you next week. Bye-bye.